Welcome back, everybody, to the Sea Mask Podcast. Back again with Will, Mike, and Tim. Last week was a legacy upload. I always like reading the comments after I post a legacy upload because everyone's like, "Is Elliot back?" <laughs> Even though it wasn't with Elliot last time, we uh, we posted the dumper episode, which was kind of a legendary episode. This was pre Mister Pantile. Um, and it was an outgrowth of uh, an R4R, Rules for Retrogrades, with Tim and Steph, where they formulated a list of all the things that you should um, look out for and perhaps dump her if your girlfriend does any of these things. Um, it was a really, really great episode on R4R that turned into like our longest sea mask ever um, with AJ and Royce. And uh, sort of in the same spirit of that, we're, we're going to be talking dating versus matchmaking today and a little bit about the company that uh, I started in three, in 13 days, it'll be an exact year. So I guess this is pretty fitting um, to be doing this episode then, um, the, the matchmaking thing. So... Uh, before we jump into that, how are you guys doing today? Anything exciting you want to bring up and start the show with? I just think it's funny that you said in the same spirit as a dumper show, uh, we've been running a <laughs> matchmaking. <laughs> like, it's kind of yeah. the opposite spirit. But Yeah, well, in also, the spirit of filtering via that list, like right. we're doing that for them. No, it is. It is. It is actually the same spirit. Royce White nearly lost a like a volunteer ex NBA player, nearly lost a volunteer coaching job over his retweet of, you know, Steph. Steph made the tweet with the complete list after we did that show with Royce and AJ, and he very nearly lost like a volunteer high school coaching job, which is hilarious. And he knows how to throw his weight around, but and he didn't end up losing it, but. He called me like laughing and, and also sort of exasperated. I was like, you know how these people work. Double down. Yep. Yeah. Double, Always double down. down. Double Always double down. Yeah. You well, only lose by apologizing. You just concede their point and then it's forever lost and you look like a cuck. So that's yeah. not what we're about here. No one loves a cuck. <laughs> no, I mean like uh, everyone loves hero. <laughs> Especially like watching a hero fall. Um but anyway, the that list which was also funny because so many people didn't understand uh that that humor was part of that and so they took that list very seriously. But there's I don't know, maybe like 70% on that list that are very legitimate things or at least outgrowths of legitimate things that you should pay attention to. Um, and what's cool about that list is that's how we vet the applicants, specifically the women applicants into us by return, which is the matchmaking service. Um, but I, I think it'd be interesting if <clears throat> maybe we just told a little bit of the history because I don't know that We've addressed this on well, we haven't addressed it on CMAS. We did talk about it a bit on Rules for Retrogrades. Um maybe about ten months ago, shortly after the service opened, we did a show. But I so 12, 14, 14 months ago, because it only took us two months to go from concept to execution with the matchmaking service. Um because we don't we don't pussyfoot. And we'll talk more about that later on because that's important in courtship as well. We weren't pussy yeah. him. We had Efficiency. the ideas and made it happen. Efficiency, taking action, is that's a really great point, Will. Um, but the the landscape of services for dating at the time it was dating um, were terrible for anybody with any modicum of virtue. If you were trying to meet somebody who you could possibly be serious about out there. It's very difficult. Um, but not just dating, but also connecting with other young people is really difficult as a Catholic. Um, everyone says like, Oh, just, we'll just go to mass and not just go to mass, go to Latin mass. Um, and, and I tried everything. I did the Latin mass. I would go to the Novus Ordo. 
I would go to Protestant churches because Tim had a really good point. Find a Protestant woman and convert her and then marry her, which is a great, great approach. If you can do it, do it. There's so many different ways to skin the cat. But just in general, I was looking around at the landscape and it's like this is um, very wanting for young Catholics. And I thought, what if we tried the matchmaking approach that I was familiar with? from you know the old country where if you had a a tight knit community of some kind there would be one or maybe two people in that community who knew everybody and could say like you you should marry this person and vice versa or there was arranged marriages depending on the religious disposition of the community um and i reached out to will it's the first time i had talked to will um i knew that you know, y'all did C mask with with Tim and so on. And said, Hey, I, I have this idea. I want to do it with Tim. Would you hop on board with it? And we had like one call. I, I put the website together and June twentieth of twenty twenty three we launched and got close to two hundred people jumping in saying, Yeah, let's do this. It was it was even weirder than that, Nick, though, because I had been getting DMs from people on Instagram talking yeah. about how they couldn't find people who shared the same values and then just got frustrated not being good with tech myself and then tweeted, does anyone know someone who's good at tech who could make something like this? Then you happen to see it and That's we're already thinking about it. And then we're like, okay, so what's stopping us? And then you just figured out how to make it happen. I did forget that. I totally forgot that you had this DM from on Instagram from this 24 year old girl. And she was like, right. Where are all the men? She's like, I'm Catholic. I'm a virgin. I'm virtuous. I attend the TLM. I want a husband. Yeah. Where are they? Right. Which is funny because that's sort of the converse of what I'm saying, which is like, I would, I would go to mass and be like, where are all the women? Right. And she's, she's going to mass and saying, where are all the men? Yeah. Um, and clearly we weren't going to the same mass. So. That's it. It's <laughs> another way that the, the trad narrative fails trads. I mean, and, and I'm not saying this like Michael Lofton. I'm saying this as a, as a trad, the trad narrative fa fails young trads. You don't just go to the Latin mass and find another young person there. I don't even know why it doesn't work. It should work because young people should. do like the Latin mass, but for for several reasons, it's not as simple as that. And one of the reasons, uh, among others, is that there still need to be more people at the Latin Mass. It still needs to be a larger portion share, portion share of Roman Catholics. But um, the, the two is the kind of decorum people. The people there will will snap at you if they think you're out of turn at all, and there's not a ton of opportunities to approach someone like during this very solemn, beautiful, right. The, the real lat, uh, the real Catholic mass, but also just because this is the, the, the best reason to make a matchmaking company. None of the old ladies there divided their time by saying, Hey, you should get together with you. You and you need to go together, which is a major modus for um, couple making that has been abandoned is an element of modernism and Protestantism and uh, of individualism and what's called Americanism, the isolated life of uh, the the modern man, alienated, isolated life. You're, you just hey, you go find it yourself. The Latin mat, you have the Latin mask. Go find it. A girl there. Well, how do I meet her? You guys don't do enough community activity. Well, we don't know. That's up to you. So we we thought we would step in and. Um, I, I mean, I hope we talk about the blowback at some point. Yeah, well, I was I was going to get there right after the the origin story, which was before we launched. But to to build on that, Tim, the um, meaningfulness of matchmaking, because in general, like men are told, and and I guess even women are told the same thing de facto, even if it's not explicated. Um, the probability of meeting your person is you know one in or five let's say let's say there are like four people in the world that are ideally compatible to you technically all men could be with all women you know plus or minus some some of the fringe cases but 
let's say there's like four people in the entire world that you could marry with great success. Um, your circumstances, uh, known as the propinquity effect, um, determine whether or not you're going to meet them. Like, do you leave home and go to college and then spend time around 10,000 people every day for four years? Or do you stay in your hometown? Are you somebody like me who never went to college, just started working? There's so many things that change the denominator, which is how many iterations can you have of meeting somebody? And I do think that it's important for men and women to approach each other if they find the other person attractive in a coffee shop or whatever. But another thing that in a world that's so fractionated, post-internet, post-car, post-Gutenberg printing, pre oh, not really, but just post-internet, post-car, is you have no idea if the cute girl at Starbucks shares, I wouldn't just say religion, I would just say even the, the beginnings of harmony with stuff that you value. And so even if you do a thousand cold approaches, you're probably going to find 995 times out of a thousand that that person's not worth date number two. Which is why there is meaning and utility in a dating app. Because you can at least select for the top 10 metrics that you're looking for. But going back to this dumper list that's, that Steph put out and they did a show. What we found is, what if we selected for the people that not just qualified with all of the true things on the dumper list? But with the spirit with which the list was made, which is to say people who watch Tim and Will's content, who are basically cool. <laughs> what, if, what if there was a service that collected cool Catholics, not just Catholics? And by converting that into an application page, and this was all very like platonic. It was all very abstract, though. And we, we had a few conversations like the body count question that's on the application. Name another dating service that asks you, hey, how many people have you slept with? We don't turn you away if the number is high. We just want to know because we might have another person whose number is high. Or if you're both virgins, like that stuff matters. But, hey, are you fat? Have you taken the, I won't say it just so we don't get banned. Have you taken <clears> the jabby jab? You know, these things really matter to people and everyone's kind of too shy to ask those questions, but we wanted to select for cool people who were courageous enough to answer those sorts of things honestly. And then, yeah, we posted about it. We posted this video and, and Tim, I don't know if you want to take over what, cause I was just dipping my toe back into the Catholic world. Like this was old hat for you, but I was so naive. I was like, guys, I have, I have a gift for you. I saw there was a problem and I wanted to solve it here. Here's, here's my gift. And then I got about a, a metric ton of tomatoes hurled at my head from all these very kind Catholics on Twitter. <laughs> and, and one other group of people as well, which is that the guys who have swallowed the emasculating feminist narrative that it's impossible to have this as a man today. Those were the two groups that we noticed. Yeah. Mike sees this on Instagram too. Those are the two groups that are really talking past each other. The men are all saying there's no good women. The women are all saying there's no good men. And it's just a diabolical masterpiece of deception. that They can't find each other to the extent they don't even believe that each other exists. But here they are both wanting the exact same thing. So that's one of the big problems we wanted to solve. And I was really taken aback. I knew it would happen, but I was still taken aback by this visceral reaction from some of the guys who, instead of being grateful for this opportunity that you, know, you truly can marry a young woman who wants to submit and believes in patriarchy, they just said, grift, it's a grift, it's impossible, can't be done, look at these grifters. That was it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and I, I guess I know that by definition, a, a man who subscribes to the ideas of the red pill is ideologically committed to the proposition that there aren't as many good women out there as we were claiming enrolled in the program, like a hundred in the first week or something, hundred plus. But and and so their their skepticism was 
There was call for it. It was warranted, at least by ideology. What Nick, who was a new, a relatively newly reverted Catholic, was really caught off guard by was the Catholics. And he said he had like a metric ton of tomatoes. It was a metric ton of shit as they shit the bed, which is what Catholics do. And it wasn't just left cats. It wasn't just the um, um, J2P2, you know, Novus Ordites it, who are like, oh, well, you know, Tim and Will are now going to do this thing after, you know, criticizing John Paul the Great. Uh, it wasn't just trads. It's all of them. I mean, comprehensively, all of them. And, you know, aside from the people that that supported it and were like, wow, this is an absolutely perfect market niche, you know. And they all insisted on calling it a dating site, uh, which was <laughs> a lie. And maybe maybe that's just ignorance or, or incautiousness of thought, which, you know, which this this goes with the online world and yes, the Catholic online world. But it was it was all of them. And so I really relish extra the success that we've had but, but it was uh, it was i can say this disconcerting for nick because you know he just come back and he's like i have this great idea i just i just it's a crazy it's a sort of crazy idea to try anything else we already have like six irons in the fire but let's try this what if we got one wait hold hear me out what if we got one match that we paired together and they were married and probably from across the country because of us through the grace of God, literally, isn't it called us? I, I'm never sure what the, what it's called. Return matchmaking by us or us matchmaking by, by return. But what if it was because of us, like three guys just put them together? Wouldn't that be amazing? We're like, well, let's try to get one. We have 200 applicants. And um, I mean, we, we really need to, we need to talk about what our numbers have been at some point. But it, the, everyone really did shit the bed. And I'm used to yeah. it. And Nick was shocked by it, as he should be, because that's the only appropriate response. Well, let's talk about that right now. So June 20th, <clears throat> we post the video a week prior. But June 20th is when you can sign up. July 24th. Steph makes the recommendation for our first match because this is a collaborative effort between the Will and Tim and then and then their wives as well. They often have a lot of input on there, which was part of the service um, because Tim and Steph, as part of this inspiration for the company, had basically done this sort of thing in the past, which is exactly the point of matchmaking is, hey, I got to know you over the last few months or few years, you've got to meet my friend. You guys would be great together. That is That saves you years and thousands of dollars and all this uncertainty when your trusted friend goes to you and says, hey, you've got to meet this person. So Steph said, hey, person A and person B, I don't know if they want to be called out, great people. It was because you guys were friends with the woman for several years. You've got to meet this man. And as of May 1st, they got married. So 10 months from never having seen a photograph of each other to holy matrimony. And when we set out, I'm on record like four or five different times saying, all I want is one marriage. One marriage justifies the entirety of this service. And we got one marriage. And now we have three or four other couples engaged and several other couples going steady in courtship. So to all the haters who said that this was a grift, which is just hilarious in terms of like, it's a, it's a service. Like we gave you a thing when you gave us money. I don't know why you would call that a grift. But not only that, it, it works. You know, there are people saying I would never let Tim or Will near my my daughters. And it's like, well, we just got your daughters married to like faithful, Catholic, virtuous. Well, not her daughters. Not the not the kids. Not the, sorry, yeah, we didn't like go in and like take your daughters and then marry them off, but their daughters are unmarried. And by the yeah. way, you it's it's three. I did you said that under your breath. 
three additional couples are engaged to be married now, like re with a date uh, for, yeah. for one of the couple's invitations in the mail. He just um, texted me two days ago. Three engagements, upcomingly, not not secular engagements, you know, years away. But that that means a success success rate of four in a relatively small pool within the first year. Four engagements, and one of those engagements being perfected into marriage in the first year, like, huh? Yeah, I mean that's that's all because just keep doubting and and um, y y shit talking. And now, of course, we're we're gonna we're gonna um, draw Mike into this in whatever way we can as well. But like, just just keep talking shit. It just makes me strong, like the BC boys say. And, and it you was really a big, yeah. So sorry, Tim. Um, no, you. Get these guys calling anything that a Catholic or Christian does with his business a grift is so funny. It's like this idea that we, how dare us, want to make a living spreading the good word and providing a service, whether it's you know, Will and I uh, saving marriages or whether it's you guys, uh, uh, you know, starting, effectively starting marriages, you can just, you know, they, they want to take their ball and go home. You can do it and complain in your mom's basement while you do nothing with your life. It's, uh, you know, are you going to call King Solomon a grifter? Like go read the Bible, you know, was Solomon a grifter for speaking and sharing wisdom and getting paid for it. Well, let's that, talk about it, the price it, point, Mike, because yeah. when we said $500, some people just squealed. They just couldn't mm -hmm. believe we dared to charge that amount of money. And so it was we doubled it. Free. It should be free. <laughs> so we then doubled it. Doubled <laughs> and and um, the, the reasoning for this goes like, so people take things seriously when money is involved, specifically mm -hmm. their own money. And this is free for all the female applicants because we're not feminists. So they know <laughs> that the men who are interested in this service are willing to put that skin in the game and they're making this a priority and they're signaling it. They also have the, the resources, the mindset to at least be in the running for being considered as men who are open to having stay-at-home wives, the traditional setup. You don't have to be super wealthy to afford this as a man, but you do have to prioritize it. You have to care. You have to be the kind of guy who doesn't waste that thousand dollars on junk food and silly subscriptions that he's not even aware of consciously that he's spending. So it filters the kind of guys that we get and that works so well. And Mike, you got two beautiful daughters. If you were interested in a service for them when they come to find husbands, how would you feel about this principle? Free for the women. The men have to make an initial declaration of interest with their finances, showing that they care about this. I'd be all for it. I'd be all for it because the way that you guys are matching them based off of body count and physical attractiveness, it's sort of a safeguard against, you know, uh, a degenerate and his silver tongue, you know, somehow, I mean, you know, Hopefully this well this never happens. You know they're relative they're very very young. So I'm gonna show them all the tips and tricks because their daddy was once that guy. <laughs> but if there was a safeguard against this and not just that, it kind of weeds out the golems, right? How many times Will and I have spoken about the golems? And as soon as you mention a price, all of a sudden this little golem comes out and they get all. If it weeds out the golems, these guys are serious and they're paired with people that are sort of somewhat on their level, especially spiritually. Uh, that's the first place I would go. I wouldn't just like put them out into the world and just see what happens. Talk about marriage. This is this is the this is a great um because there's a, uh, that aside, this other service will remain nameless. I've seen a bunch of them, and one in particular in the faith space fail miserably. And so I'm great. To, it's it's amazing to see, especially you guys get involved with something like this. I've never seen anything like it, and it's hey, fulfilling Mike, a great need. No, no need to name names, obviously, but. Why do these other services fail from your perspective, having seen the inside of some of them? Why do they fail? Well, first of all, uh, there's really not a lot of involvement from the person that actually uh, created this service. It's like, okay, let's pay this low amount. So first of all, there's no skin in the game. And it's just essentially uh, a Tinder or a hinge with this sort of like, well, you guys are traditional, but it could be Catholics. It could be somebody that thinks they believe in God, that's spiritual, they're not religious, they could be you know, Protestants, whatever, but it's kind of a mixed bag. The tech isn't thought all the way through, so it's clunky. You know, I think there's no not enough skin in the game, and the people that are actually involved aren't actually involved in trying to nurturing this, this service to make it what it should be. So it's kind of like, okay, just give me your money and just kind of see what happens. There's mm -hmm. no screening process. There's no 
uh, you know, the questions that you guys have and actually the time and attention and care put into it. It's just, let's just start a service and try to, that to me, to me, all those factors lent it, itself to the idea that that's actually a grift because you're like, okay, traditional marriage. Okay. And then what? And then you get on the inside and there's nothing there. Mm. So I, I signed up for the service that shall remain nameless as market research to see, because it was our sort of main competitor in the space. What, what are they doing? What's their pool of people like? What's the user interface like? How is, how does this work? And I was appalled. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely appalled. And once again, the fundamental difference is dating app or matchmaking. So with a dating app, you pay or it's free, but either way, you enter a pool of people. The goal is to have as many people in that pool as possible because of that, that fraction that I said at the beginning of the episode. You're just trying to increase the probability that the one to four people that you could have a successful marriage with are part of the tens of thousands that you might have access to. So what you're doing is you're paying for access to a catalog of people. And then you're hoping that after you've applied the filters of things that you value, that are your non-negotiables, that there's anybody left over worth talking to. And even without those filters, the answer is typically no, because most people aren't cool. Most people suck. Most people are not people that you'd want to be best friends with for the rest of your life. See every single day for most of your day and talk with. So as a point of comparison, difference between matchmaking and dating apps. This is, and I'll, maybe I'll put it on the screen so people don't have to like keep these numbers in their head. Um, this is from a, a 20, this is from a Reddit post where a guy took a screenshot of his analytics of six years in one day on Tinder. Now, this is, somebody would might go, well, Tinder, that's not a good comparison because like we're Catholics or we're Christians. I would say nay, nay, that with Tinder, the bar is lower for marriage and commitment um, than Catholic, Catholics and Christians who typically are far more discerning and they, they, they're picky. They have little things like, Oh, he's, he has to have a devotion to marry or I'm not going to marry him. And you're like, Oh my gosh. Like we get these applications. Like he needs to pray a rosary at six noon and 6 PM. Otherwise I'm not going to marry him. Like this is the type of stuff we deal with. All right. But <clears throat> 28 year old male goes on Tinder for six years in one day. He takes a screenshot of the analytics. Note the difference. He swiped left or right 207,033 times. He swiped left 22. You can put this up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he swiped left 2,244 times. And he swiped right 204,789 times. So, right there is something very fascinating that a guy is far less picky than most women. He swiped right like 98%, 99% of the times, 204,789 times he swiped right and said, let's do this. I'm willing to at least throw, throw a swipe right on here. And out of that 204,000 right swipes, he only got 2,292 matches, roughly one Ooh. in 10 or uh, one in a hundred. Hmm. One in a hundred matches saw his profile and said, this guy is somebody who just when his profile photo hits my eyeballs, it's not repulsive. Like, yeah, basically I'd sleep with him is, is what that swipe right match means. So of the 2,292 matches, only 551 of those turned into conversations. Out of those 551 541 he never met. He went on 10 dates out of that 551. So just before we get to the end here, 207,000 times this guy made a discernment, turned into 10 dates. Three of those turned into relationships. Seven was casual sex. 
and one marriage. Now, there's a little metric here, which is kind of fascinating. On the, on the right, it said zero, no spark. So of the three relationships and several, seven casual sex, zero of them did he have a spark. But he's still married, this person. Six years and one day, 207,000 swipes, one marriage. Compare that to 10 months, no photograph, holy matrimony. That's the difference between matchmaking and dating. And for the guys whining about the price, we've it's got another go interesting again. reference. <laughs> yeah, it's going up again. Because then we'll get a higher caliber of men involved who care about it more, which is good for everyone. But the average year of dating costs a little bit over 1.5K. And it doesn't lead to marriage. And no one's paying that poor guy for his time swiping right that often. So it's much more cost and time efficient to actually get the help that you need to get the result that you want rather than just doubling down on your own efforts, which have failed you so far. Yeah. And that price point will of $1,560 being the average that a man spends in a year on dating, dating that doesn't lead to marriage is why that's where we're going to raise the price to. We started at 500 and we realized low prices help nobody. Um, a year's expenditure of dating is worth getting your wife in one year. Any any guy who disagrees, please, we aren't interested in you. Not that you shouldn't be interested in us. We're not interested in you. Trust me. <laughs> we turn people down all the time. Well, I should say I do. I'm sort of the, um, the, the first point of filter. We've gone through a lot of behind the scenes iterations on how to structure and organize how we're doing this. Um, a lot, a lot of thought has been put into how do we get uh, success with ingesting and digesting all these applications and matching people. Um, but I'm now the, the first point of contact. So when a, a woman or a man applies, goes to me first, and I determine, is this somebody we want in the service? Is this person going to annoy Tim or Will uh, for, the, for the next six months? Or are they... Are they somebody? And okay, another thing that we should point out too. Our engagements, all three of our engagements, correct me if I'm wrong on this, they're all right now under 28 years old, the youngest being a 20 year old man and I think a 19 year old. I, I can't remember how old she is, but he's 20. Well, uh, they're boy. a couple. The, the couple who got married that was engaged were in their 30s. And but now we have three. Yeah, the three engagements. Three additional though, engagements. There are. Old. Yeah, it's a 20 year old guy, a 24 year old guy. And I can't remember the age of the a 25 year old guy. Um, yeah. And the women are within a, within a year, either the same age or within a year of that. So to the people who are skeptical about that, and then also the people who are getting married are very attractive. That's a very I know. I know that's a big thing because we get asked, well, how, how come I can't see a photo first? Because it's not a dating site because we're not asking you. Would you like to swipe left or right on this person? We're saying, we got to know you. For the guys, we, we do a video interview. For the women, they send, send in a video answering very tough, easily sniffed out feminist, anti-feminist questions. We're getting to know you here. We know what you are. You're, you're a five. You're a seven. You're a three. <laughs> you're a nine. We ask them what they think they are on the application, which, which has been a trip to... To see. It's always higher than what it actually is, isn't it? Sometimes by like an like a hundred percent, which is why I said a few times that pride is the number one reason. I think pride yeah. is the number one reason why both men and women are single, and you have to be humble just to put aside your own judgment here about what you think you deserve, and just say. You guys pick for me. You do yeah. it because I've tried myself enough times and it hasn't been working out. It's it's such a funny thing to, and this is, I guess, somewhat of a warning to anybody who's thinking of applying. Guys or girls, but especially guys because they're the ones who pay. They are technically our customers. Um, the women are just expressing the feminine virtue of availability. 
by joining our service that like women should see this as something that they can have ongoing in their lives just apply enter the, enter the program it's free it's literally free and have this as going on in the background instead of having a dating app on your phone know that there are three virtuous patriarch okay two virtuous patriarchs and one virtuous non-patriarch and their wives looking for your husband right now just let that go on in the background um, but guys who are applying this is not you paying to then like sit with us and try and tell us what to find for you it's the exporting of responsibility that's what the matchmaking is it's not a mail order bride service no you're not paying for a catalog of women that you get to peruse and tell us well i want this one you're paying tim and will for an honest assessment of you and then an assortative pair and if you don't trust us don't sign up but we we have the receipts now which is which is very exciting and i think year 2 of this business is going to uh to demonstrate that we fleshed out the process and in 2024 we have a matchmaking service facility whatever um that's meaningfully effective for the Catholic world that may have existed in a tiny little town 150 years ago, 250 years ago. Right. And for the women, they know that the men are serious and want marriage within about 12 months. It's so hard to find that. I know because the women say again and again, these guys are like just big kids. They just want to flirt, fornicate. They don't want to commit. Where are the ones who were serious? We've got them. Most guys just want to play house with their girlfriends. That's the reality. Yep. And that's partly why as well, it's only for Catholics. I did amend the grammar on the site recently because yes, technically the Orthodox do have sacraments. Originally on the site, I said only Catholics have sacraments. But the point being is that marriage is a sacrament. We're not here trying to set people up to playhouse. We're trying to set up the sacrament of matrimony um, and let, you know, let you guys take it over. Like here, here's your sniper shot at a spouse uh, who found us. You might think too, from a, from a number standpoint that well, there's no way that the irony. To, so Tinder has tens of millions of users. We have a couple hundred how did we get a marriage in 10 months and people can't find a marriage in six years on Tinder? That shouldn't, that alone makes the marriage in a year like 1,000 to 10,000 times more improbable. This isn't accidental. This is like natural law playing out, basically. But Will, your your comment about pride is something that's sort of been. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit more? And and Mike, you as well, because you guys deal with with married couples on the other side of this thing. Well, what is it about pride that's precluding men and women from getting married and 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 really swinging for the fences with this? You go, Mike. I think what both men and women share. Um, in, within terms of pride is that they both think they deserve better than they actually do. And there's a, there's a, a, a lack of self-awareness in what you see in a lot of people and how they rate themselves. Um, you get guys on the one hand where they're literally four out of 10, four out of 10 and they're short and they got nothing going for them, but somehow they think that they deserve because they're uh, uh, porn addicts. Uh, they think they deserve a 10 out of 10 that's willing to do all these kinds of depraved acts in bed. And then you have these women that are four out of 10 and 300 pounds that because they've, you know, maybe been on the, uh, the carousel a few times on Tinder and got swung above their, 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 you know, their league a little bit there that they deserve way better than they do. And I see this play out huge. And then you also got, and I dunk on the doomer, uh, 
incels as well, where they've just consumed way too much red pill content. Um, they think they, I mean, they also think that they they're better than they are. They've got nothing going for them, but somehow they think they deserve a supermodel, virtuous virgin, despite, you know, being, um, degenerates or want to be degenerates in general thinking that, Oh bro, you know, the tens, it's the top 1% of men that have 99% of women and there's no point. And I'm just going to take my ball ball and go home. Um, so I would say those are probably the two most common, um, points of pride that I see with men and women, especially in the dating landscape right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, those people, I mean, listen, man, if I had not, had I not met my wife and this was around, uh, and I'm just saying this because, you know, you guys are my homies and I love you guys. I'd sign up for this 100%. I mean, talk about sifting through the waste of time and the wasteland that is the, the dating landscape. And if 1500 bucks is too much for you, then you're a brokey and return doesn't want you. <laughs> it's, it's not even that you're broke is that your priorities <laughs> aren't what they should be. The average car payment in the US is now over 1K a month. Like the That's guy average? Who, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just gone over 1K Whoa. a month. So <laughs> the, the, the people who think they can't afford it, you can, but it's not your priority. And that's mm. why we don't want you. Yeah. Get that through your head. It's not your priority. Now, the point about pride is really important because if you understand what the concept of average means, you know that most people are average, right? And a lot of people are below average, around half uh, below average. And this is something that people don't want to face because if you look at the data, and this goes for men too, men, in fact, more so than women, are going to cluster around the more attractive members of the opposite sex. That's what the actual data shows on the sites like Tinder, et cetera. Men tend to gravitate towards the most attractive women visually because men are very visually orientated. So most guys are average at best and they're interested in women who are slightly above average. And they're thinking, well, where are all the good women? Why are all these women that are actually interested in me 10, 20 pounds overweight or whatever it might be? Well, it's because they're actually a good fit for you. You can help them lose a bit of weight, et cetera. They need male leadership. Women tend to be a, a mess without male leadership. If you're willing to actually do that, you can have a decent chance at a happy life together. But you're not. You think you're entitled to something more because you've got an inflated view of yourself, which is what pride is. And that's what's keeping you back from having a shot at happiness. I'll address the, the ladies. This problem of unrealism is as bad with the ladies and I don't mean to impugn women wanting to do as best as they can or men wanting to do the best that they can in terms of the sexual marketplace or whatever you want to call it. That's, that's just the law of self-interest applied to the sacrament of matrimony. No problem, but you have to be realistic as to what your bounding function is and your bounding function is yourself and what you're projecting out there to the world. So we're not impugning someone that's like, I want to do the best I can, get the best spouse, you know, kindest, most virtuous, best looking. We're not making fun of that. But, and, and you know, I can say this from perusing 200 plus applications. Every single woman, aside from two or three out of 200, said, look, I, I just want, you know, get, get, get me as close to a six foot man as you can, or, or they would actually say six foot minimum. They, I was shocked. I was shocked how important this is. I, I'd heard from Tinder. I'd heard from the manosphere. I've heard from, you know, I, I, long ago before there was Steph, I was, I was dating and I was like, Phew, this is such an odd female preferences are so funny to us. Like, I, why don't you care about muscles more than height? It's such a, or such a random thing ostensibly and, and guys kind of laugh about it. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, I couldn't do anything about it if I weren't, but I'm glad I, I hit the mark. This is what I thought as a young man. And it's true. Every single woman says this, every single man says thin. So I just want to put that out there aside from maybe two or three that were like, you know, have, have a, um, a fetish for something else. I, I don't think any of the women who left off the height requirement, had like a short fetish. Maybe, maybe some guy had had a a reverse <laughs> hourglass figure fetish or something like that. You know, that yeah. there, there is such a thing in certain communities. So, like, 
okay, there were like two or three of those, but every single guy, 99% said thin. Every single woman said as close to six foot as you can get me. Why? Oh, why? In our society, do we impugn the men for having a, an obviously teleologically wired, consistent taste, but not the women and everyone already knows the answer. But the, the point is we're not impugning you for, for having that. We're saying one, don't lend your hand to the, or your voice to the feminist double standard that it's mean for guys to want thin women. That's what men are visually attracted to like 10 times out of 10, just like women seem to be attracted to six foot, but also realize that to whatever extent you're not meeting. And there are a couple other metrics that seem meaningful. It was like two, for men and two for women when they when you talk about what they care about but like that's the main one that comes up for each sex and you should be understanding of the fact that assortative pairing is a thing you will get paired with as high as we can pair you with given your own debilities given your own limitation i mean if it's like six foot uh, brad pitt except he's six foot three and super Catholic, it's like, okay, yeah, we could just throw the, the, the best at him. And of course, we do take temperament and personality into account in a limited way when we do this. That's why we interview all the men and we at least virtually interview all the women. But men and women, you need to understand this. And we should do a call for applications because we need, we, we we're ready now as we head into the second year for a second batch, a, a big batch rather than the trickling in that we've done the last six months. I approach this as, you know, this is a Twitter patient um, summer and, and early fall thing. And, you know, we've, we've had applications trickle in since, since then, but um, I'd love to get another big batch like we did when we, we announced this last June, a year ago now. Yeah. And, and guys, this is the least expensive it's going to be. I haven't raised the price yet for business reasons on our end, like dealing with payment processing and so on and so forth. But um, it's currently a thousand dollars. It's going to go up to fifteen hundred. So guys who are watching who want to throw their hat in the ring, now's your chance. To the to the pride point as well. That's also one of the reasons why we instituted a, a thirty five age limit on this. Um, my purpose with this service was to help analogs of myself who's 25 and 24 i guess at the time um but we notice as well that not in all cases but in most cases the older you are as a single person the more prideful or delusional you had to be to get to that age if you're knocking on 40 and you're single and then you come to us and you have this laundry list of preferences you're not getting it you're not getting it. That's that's why you're coming to us. That's why you're single. And that well, includes if you're six foot, multiple six figures, but you're not in yep. other areas what you think you are, and you're demanding a 20-year-old woman. Like That's why you're single. And we get so many of those. We get so many of those. And Tim was mentioning the the difference in preferences between height and weight. Guys who hear that, threat not. Don't worry about being six foot or not and entering the service. It hasn't mattered in the success stories that we have so far. Women say they want six foot. What they want is a guy who's just a little bit taller than them. That's actually what matters at the end of the day. Of course, it, if a woman says six foot, that will qualify unless we, we have like two very, very tall women. There's only two in our entire pool. And so, of course, they're like, hey, can I get a guy who's like 6'3 because I'm 6'1 or I'm six foot? And like, but even for them, they're saying, I just want a guy who's a little bit taller than me because that's like natural law. They want when they hug you, they don't want to be like looking down at the top of your head. And if that if that passes the check, that's it. So guys, don't be discouraged by that at all. Um, women get in shape and like both both of you will we'll check the, the physical box uh, that seems to be an impediment for so many people. Um, but yeah, the height thing, 
hasn't mattered. The money thing doesn't matter either at all. We have guys who are right out of college or in college. Actually, one of our gate engagements is a, is a fellow who's in university right now. He's 20 years old. Guys who are listening, he spent $1,000, 20 years old, is engaged, will be married by the time he's 21 or 22. I don't know if he's 21 right now, but when he applied, he was 20. He's going to be married by 21 before he can have a beer. He's going to be married. Like, what is your excuse? It's not because he's making six figures, and he's not six feet tall. <laughs> and I can say as well that um, you see cases where women in that age bracket will turn down the guy that might be six foot six figures and is in his mid thirties or early thirties because she recognizes something in the younger guy, which means she's going to bet on his potential. Like the match is so good between them that she's thinking he might just be in college still and not be earning six yeah. figures and not be six foot. But there's something about this guy that means that I want to follow him through life. I can see it already. What, uh, Mike and Will, how old were you, gents, when you had your firstborn? Oh, I was man. 28. Way younger. So I've shared a few times. Look, I wasn't raised Christian. I was a, I was a bad kid. I was, um, got uh, pregnant before I was 20. So I'd have been 20 when my first was born. Based. Okay. Yeah, that's based. I, I, I mean, I had based. Tim, I had, I had three kids before I was even married. Oh, I didn't oh, know that. Right? Do you know so, that? Yeah. So I like my my upbringing was not not Christian whatsoever. I actually came to the realization that I needed to get all this fixed because through loving my wife and kids, just through natural law, I was just working my way out of atheism. Like from that. So yeah, when I was a young kid, I made a mess up a lot of stuff. So that was that. Well, I was asking oh. because I would argue that it's a greater disorder to be Catholic all your life, a practicing good Catholic, and um, pass up opportun good opportunities for marriage and hit 37, 38. Uh, people might not like this, but hit 37 and 38 and be like, well, uh, you know, I pass up some opportunities, but I still want to have kids. I understand we, you know, we, we've, we've tried some 37, 38 year olds too. Or even 27 and 28, uh, I guess I was 27 when I had my first kid. Mike, you were 28. Mm -hmm. That's pretty old. Like, if you look at the females, unless you're dating someone that's or, you know married to someone that's way, 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 way younger, there's a purpose in where I'm going here. Females have lost like 80% of their eggs by the time they're 22 or 23. I have to double check the exact age, but females are most fertile at like 17, 18, 19, 20. It starts dropping rapidly. 21, 22, 23, you're getting into in terms of ovular life, all the eggs one will ever have. You're getting into old maiddom by middle 20s, ovularly speaking, and very, very politically incorrect stuff. I would just say that Mike, me and you at 27 and 28 were for related reasons, guys who basically were, were coming back to the faith. Even I, I, you know, I got married at 24. What, how old were you when you got married, Mike? Uh, 28. Oh, you're 28. Okay. So you had, yeah. So, I mean, I'd say Will's model of having kids younger is more in accord with the natural law, even yeah. without the sacramer sacramental marriage until later. Then 27, I look at that and I'm like, whoa, I mean, at least I was 20 under 25 when I got married, but like, I'm kind of a modernist. I, it should be particularly, it's not like I got married when I was 20. Once you hit 25, you are in the realm of, and they, they've done personality tests, particularly on men, um, crystallizing personality where it's, it's going to be hard for you to deal with really, really normal aspects of family life. I mean, most of us were raised, if we do the average, in a household with um, point, point 0.7 other siblings besides ourselves, right? It's like 1.7, 1.8. So I'm the one and my sibling is the point 0.7 or the point 0.8 others, if we're looking at the US average. This is very disordered. Um, 
let you know not even replacement rate level of reproduction in the united states so people don't know how to be ar around a normal household you know 10 11 12 kids and and um you know my my older friends who never married come over and you know what what by historical standards is a small household mine seven kids my friends who never married who are 40 or late 30s or even you know, mid thirties can, can start having a, a weird non-natural response to like my smaller than average, you know, 1100 AD sized family. And the point <laughs> is that it is impossible or near impossible to match men um, once they're approaching 40. Now women get more pliant because they typically have wanted marriage all along but they're difficult to match, even though they have a good attitude, a 35, 36, 37 year old woman, they have the right attitude, but they have the biological uh, limiting reagent on children that men don't have. So for, for variant reasons, 35 has to be the cap. And I like literally dudes that hit 30 and don't have kids yet. You have to understand how unnatural this is. We're not saying we're not saying that it's too late for you. That's why you have five more years. We accept people up to 35, but you're going to be cringing when you shouldn't be cringing. You should, by the time, by the time I was 27, I should have had four kids. Um, it, it, people are most fertile when they're 20. So Will, Will's more in accord with the natural law. And the, the bearing this has on expectation management for things like high, household quietude, and and needing you know um, I forget what it's called in Misery the Stephen King novel but like she notices if Mister Mister Popper the Penguin or something like this she's got some weird name she's like he always faces north east northeast and like James Caan had had bumped the the little penguin statue a little bit so she knew this is people that live together live alone for too long they start getting uninhabitable. Yep, Tim, I know a funny story about this is a a guy who managed to adopt some kids in his late 40s early 50s and i know that to to escape from the unbearable stress of just having a couple of kids in the house he has to do what he always used to do when he was childless up until that point and drive about 40 minutes to the seaside have his coffee and just wind the windows down and have a nap in the sea air because two kids is just too much for him to deal with and that to me is just a great example of what you're talking about like you're yeah. used to the peace and quiet of that household. And every little thing irritates you so badly. You have to run away by yourself and sit by the seaside to recover, to come back, just to face your normal duties as a man, because your character is set. You can't cope. And the other thing is that most guys don't know this. The risk of erectile dysfunction triples after age 40 and sperm quality starts deteriorating before that. So, that 30 cutoff point, men don't have all the time in the world either. That's one of the lies you've been told. that You can be this high value 60 year old man. You might be able to get someone pregnant still. But here's the stat. Even with women who are under age 25. So even with the dream girl that you probably won't get, by the way, even if she is under 25, men over 45 still find it five times harder to impregnate her. Five times harder, even if she's under 25. So this idea wow. that age doesn't matter for men, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah, and so wow. a couple things. So one, when I see guys or women over 30, and especially 40, that aren't married with kids, um, there is an undiagnosed character flaw there for sure, or maybe diagnosed. Who knows? Most of the time, though, these people are like, well, I don't, I don't know why I'm single. It's like it's just failure to acknowledge the reason why you're single. Um, but again, pride kind of hardens over your heart past a certain age and you kind of get stuck in your ways. In my case, looking back, I wish I would have had kids way earlier. I bought into the feminist lie and the red pill lifestyle hook, line and sinker, which is kind of like the impetus for me coming out and talking about this stuff a couple of years ago anyways. Um, in an ideal scenario, I would have started having kids at you know, 21, 22, 23. I was basically functionally retarded around that age, but nevertheless... <laughs> I'd love to, you know, uh, have 10 kids by now, but that, that, uh, that's specifically why I'm so passionate about speaking against the red pill stuff. Cause a lot of guys get the other age of 30 
and you know they wish they at least had a couple of little ones running around um but normie retards would look at you and be like okay 28 uh yeah married with your first kid okay that you're starting still a little early literally early early yeah Yeah. you know how many times i got told just wait wait till you're 30 35 that's a good age to start you know get it out of your system you know yeah it's 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 uh it's so backwards (laughs) it's a it, it, it yeah, go ahead, Will. Don't you want to wait until your sperm quality declines a bit more? <laughs> well, yeah. what Tim is saying, it, this is somewhat of a recent line of thought for me, because because of how deracinated we are, you have to reinvent the wheel, which is kind of what we're doing. Like We are reproving natural law by way of recognizing how destroyed modernity is we're reverse engineering like rules that used to just be de facto a priori understandings of western civilization which was get married very young have a lot of children and something that i'm having to realize and maybe this will be helpful to any guy who's listening the purpose of marriage is children and what that doesn't mean and i'm saying this more for myself so I'm assuming other guys, they think this way as well. What I'm coming to learn is that if the purpose of marriage is children and you get married young and start having children, what that doesn't mean is that you are abnegating self-actualization and it doesn't mean you're abnegating romance with your spouse. And I think those are two reasons why people try to put off having kids is they think if I have kids now, I don't get to become the type of person that I want to be. It expedites that process, in fact. Which is something that I don't, I I can understand rationally, but I haven't experienced yet because I don't have kids. And the other is that, is this belief that your, your wife become, is no longer your girlfriend. She's the partner in this really annoying task that you have to do every day called parenting. Can you guys maybe speak to the fact that both of those are lies that might be delaying men from jumping into marriage and having kids right away? Well, the, the, the question what a man is and what a woman is today is pretty confused. And I think it's largely due, due to contraception severing sex from procreation because yep. the, the essence of manhood is the potential for fatherhood. The essence of womanhood is the potential for motherhood. Like that's what the two sexes are aimed at. So you can think of fatherhood and motherhood, which involves marriage, as being the way that you fully unlock your masculinity and femininity. Like you will get to know yourself better as a man through being a father, better as a woman through being a mother. Now, I think that there's a point we haven't talked about much, which is some of these people in their 30s, they might be called to be in religious orders. Like the abolishment of nunneries was a really big thing in western culture i don't think we've recovered from it so some of them might have a different vocation but for pretty much everyone else marriage is your vocation and that's where you're truly gonna find yourself as culture tells you yeah you don't find yourself by sticking a metal rod into your vagina or ejaculating into a bag guys that's that's put that on a t-shirt (laughs) <laughs> I would say I thought I was doing something with my life in my 20s I had my first daughter and it was talk about progress on the fast forward button like hitting things at like two times the speed in terms of spiritual growth financial growth uh, growth within my marriage um, that's just another one of these lies right and the and, and the lies of the enemy are kind of like a whisper that kind of makes sense to your mind uh, but because we're so spiritually fractured, we don't have the discernment that comes from, you know, uh, Catholicism, the perfect expression of the natural law, that people are kind of, they, and they're, they're in the steady state of um, putting second things first and first things second, meaning, and I'm going to use Tim's favorite word, uh, telos, throwing the, the teleological order out of sync by putting pleasure first and uh, procreation second. When he also yeah. talks about he being the antecedent there being Tim again, uh, is chapter six case for patriarchy of the sacramentalization of work. I also wonder if there's Tim, feel free to build on this. Maybe you've already done so in the past. Um, When work becomes a sacrament, when your career becomes your vocation itself, Mm -hmm. then it would make sense that you would feel terrified that 
doing your vocation is uh, re refusing um, that, that, that feeling of self-actualization. It's like, well, I am a entrepreneur. I'm not a father. And if I stop doing this entrepreneur stuff and I do the father stuff, like I'm just going to be so bored. Like, what do I even have to tell? It's, it's a three-year-old. Like it doesn't even know what's going on. Like I want to go start a business. I actually had somebody yeah. say uh, he was very, 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 very wealthy guy. He was a client of mine worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, he said, Mike, and this was when my daughter was very, very, you know, she was maybe a couple months old. She's not even going to know who you are until she's five. You know, oh, so no. yeah, oh, no. I had eight as much had money two as you lawyers. Can. The, the two ahead, lawyers Tim. that mentored me. Oh, oh sorry. I thought the, the, yeah. I was just gonna say I had no nope. I had two guys say that to me as if it were exemplary, because both of them yeah, yeah. grew up in lawyer families with lawyer dads. And it was um Ber Bernie and Robert sat me down the year I worked in the law firm, and they're like, you know, you you're leaving at about six on average every day 6 p.m they're like do you think you're staying long enough and i was like uh i think i'm staying too long like i like being home before dinner you know uh, with a little time to shoot hoops with the kids or whatever and they're like yeah you probably need to add an hour on there and i was like you know i mean i guess i could push dinner back a little bit we don't eat super early but they're like well but a lot of nights you don't make dinner they're like tim i don't and robert says to bernie you know what do you have any memories bernie of your dad who's count, county council um of, of your dad when you were like before kindergarten he was like no i don't do you robert and he was like no and i was like all right well so i'm leaving you know i mean that's where i was like i, I definitely am leaving and um yeah i mean the way will put it is almost always the perfect uh efficient expression but i think there's actually an understatement in what will said it's not just that a young man or a young woman will get to know themselves much better once they become a parent not a spouse that's 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 hallmark channel uh like boomer lady estrogenic nonsense it's not you don't get to know yourself better as a spouse you get to know your true self your telos as a parent, as a father, or, or if you're a young woman out there as a mother, okay? So that it's it's the most important thing. Now, the most important relationship you'll cultivate one-on-one -on -one is with your spouse because they become one flesh with you. But yeah, even, I, I mean, Nick, you're saying girlfriend, oh, she didn't stop being a girlfriend. Girlfriend's a petty, trivial, trifling term. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, one is. from a, a very post enlightenment term, like, I don't think it dignifies the, I, I think Steph might've said it in her book, like, we'll still date your wife or kind of, I, I don't think it dignifies the the role of husband wife or the, the rapport between husband and wife, the rapport between husband and wife is dignified by, we just had intercourse and created, co-created, um, our first born. And now we relate together as a family you know, is an all, almost uh, spiration level yeah. of trinity. And with the husband, wife, firstborn, you're getting into the, you know, fact, meaningful facsimiles of the trinity that are closest approximating what is the pinnacle of our faith, the, the trinity, uh, mother, father, and it's not just with the firstborn, mother, father, child in question, mother, father, son or daughter and you don't know yourself except by reference to the trinity and you don't know yourself except by reference to this individual rapport so i have seven kids so it's me i look at steph then i look at um nick last night you and i were talking about charlie one of my twins who i i before i came up here today she was the only kid that was awake i just went and i gave her a big hug we, we were talking about things that scare Charlie last night. I was, I was over with Nick late last night. We were talking about lots of stuff. So it's mother, father, and that child, you know, that's how I think of myself um, is in reference to the other half of my flesh, Steph and, and child one, what do they need? Where are they thriving? Where are they falling short? How is it related to me? How is it not related to me? But in, in both cases, how can I help how it's, Which, you know, one of my failings as a father 
even if it's not one of my failings as a father, how can I help? I have to do that with seven little humans. And that's my entire being is me in reference to Steph um, fathering or parenting um, as many of these little little creatures as God sees fit to give us. And it's it's my entire identity in Christ, my wife and my kids. Well, this was just... Sorry, go ahead, Nick. Uh, I think I just figured out maybe how or why that's the case that you know you come to know yourself through the child and the spouse, but namely if the purpose of marriage is children and you come to know yourself by becoming a father. I think it's because you said you said co-created. The child is not just the average of mother and father. It's because it's not a human person with a, a created soul unless God co-creates with you. So there's actually like part God in this third person that didn't exist before and exists now, but it's a product of you and your wife. And so as you come to know the child, you're coming to know part of yourself because that thing didn't exist. It's like it's a spiration, like you said, Tim, of you. But it didn't exist before. So you literally have to meet part of yourself in in person, in time, to come to know who you are. And on an introspective level, it puts a microscope over the best of you and the worst of you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't, if you're not aware of this, this is how like generational issues continue to pass on because of that lack of self-awareness. And this is one of the big, 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 big reasons, uh, praise God, I reverted to Catholicism was I was confronted with this reality of I'm responsible for these souls, not just my own soul. So shouldn't the quote unquote spiritual head of the family know where we stand as a family in spirit and in communion with our Lord. And so every day, my wife and I were just talking about how we've been parenting and whatnot. And these conversations are incredibly uh, confronting. Mm. And and it, it reminds me <laughs> of that process of reversion because it's incredibly humbling in that confrontation yeah you're revealed with the best and worst of yourself on a daily basis right yeah and it's it for me it was really interesting that nietzsche with his vision of the superman has nothing to say about marriage and family and mm. the daily <laughs> practicalities of life like the superman is just someone who kind of lives in a tree house on a mountain and maybe he's kind of jacked and he howls at the moon and he has some buddies who do the same thing but there's nothing about women and children. And once you're actually in that situation and you are humbled by the fact that these demands on you are so great and you can't even keep the natural law. If you're honest with yourself, you can't even keep the natural law without God's help. That's when it all breaks down and you realize that there's more to it than just the, uh, the Superman bro who just lives his own life. And is that why Zarathustra is a tightrope between man yeah. and Ubermensch? Well, is because they're walking yeah. around from yurt to yurt on top of three. <laughs> Probably. Funny. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other point that's really big here is that the, the, the church teaches basically that the, the whole of eternity passes through the family. Like that phrase that guys love in Gladiator, which is, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Every man kind of thrills to that because the hairs on the back of my neck just went up. And that's what the family is. Like everything you're doing echoes in eternity, most of all in the family. And being the smart cat that he was, Aristotle made this link between procreation and eternity. So he's talking about how the fact that procreation is basically the most natural act of the living organism. And through that, it participates in the eternity of God. What you're trying to do is get a kind of eternity through mm -hmm. procreation, the child living on after the parents and so on and so on down the generations. I don't think that's fully articulated because he's just grasping at something which, as with a lot of what he said, is on the cusp of what Revelation tells us. But a lot of those Greek pagan philosophers, they had that same insight. There's something about the family and eternity that matters so much. I've got a call coming up, guys. I've got to go. But it's been a pleasure to speak to you, as always. Take care, guys. Great episode. God bless you, dudes.